and welcome to the kindness formula it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight tonight what i'm going to do is share the kindness formula with you and uh, i'm also going to share with you why a lot of people don't have access to this formula the good news is we're all born kind now my objective in this program is to convince you and this may be a challenge at first to convince you that we're all kind in fact we all start off that way and we're and we never lost it it may appear that some people don't have any kindness in them at all but that's an illusion and again my goal is to with this program to convince you that that in fact is true now what's going against that reality is we do live in a culture of violence if you live in the West, if you're listening to this program from any place in the West, you know that we do live in a culture of violence. So the breaking news, odds are if you get a little uh, alert on your uh, phone, uh, breaking news or on your computer, it's going to be something reflecting some kind of violence. There's violence being served on the news every single day. It's horrifying. It's frightening and it's constant okay and the one common link in fact there's several common links to this steady stream of violence and in the case of the news it's you know the treating the other okay the other as someone to fear and that's what we're learning from the media to treat the other as someone to fear now that does get in our way to to be kind to be kinder to people it's it's difficult to be kind to people when you're afraid of them and uh so the news gives us a steady stream the evening news the steady stream of things to fear but not just in in bad people and and things that are happening that is bad around the world but also fearing other people and and you're seeing violence in as far as attacking the character of another human being attacking their their viewpoint and uh we're, we've been seeing a lot more of that especially with uh, news organizations like fox um, cnn has them but to a lesser degree but obviously the common link here is in this case treating the other as the enemy just because they have a different opinion than you do i mean there used to be a time that we, we would give that other person the respect and the courtesy without treating them like they were our enemy but that's what happens when you live in a culture of violence okay and of course the the king of violence of course is hollywood if you take a look at the common themes as far as the evening shows that you're watching in your home or you're watching at the movie theater the common theme of course is more violence where we learn unconsciously perhaps to treat the other as someone to kill or someone who's going to kill us certainly promoting a culture of fear again and to top it all off if you take a look at the gaming industry the size of the global gaming industry is absolutely humongous it's over a 77 billion dollar industry and it glorifies violence and if you take a look at the top games they include tour of duty assassin's creed and battleland it's all about glorifying violence and killing and it's not just there it's absolutely this culture of violence is everywhere it's in the way we treat our planet it's in the way we treat our trees our soil our water and in this case the um the culture is treating other in this case the land as something that can be replaced well not so fast but that's what we've been conditioned to think okay and even the food industry indirectly promotes violence of course, when they say uh, we're going to serve you up a nice sirloin steak, they don't say sirloin cow. They call they use words like beef because it doesn't sound like cow. In this case, we've been conditioned to treat the other, in this case, a cow, as insignificant, as in fact stupid, or as an object to be used for our nourishment. Okay, and in the process, avoid other things that are also important in your ability to be kind. And we'll talk about that. How else could we justify treating cows so horribly in these conditions where they're standing in their own feces all day long and they die a horrendous death if we didn't have a culture of violence? 
So in this case, we, we the one constant, whether it's a politician or what we're hearing about in the news or an animal, we're learning to treat the other. The common link here is treating the other as separate, okay, from us. Now, for those of you who've done any kind of research on slaughterhouses, for example, here you may have seen this picture here on the uh, left hand of your screen here. This is a bull. And uh, in this case, he was about to be uh, killed. He was at a slaughtering house and uh, he's crying. He's experiencing fear and he's sad. And uh, of course, here on the right is a slaughterhouse in Oklahoma. And these are horses. One, you see the guy there, he's holding a bolt gun, which basically puts the horse on, doesn't kill them, puts them unconscious or partially unconscious while they uh, start to cut them up. And you can see the fear in, in this horse's eyes. And being kind means recognizing that sentient beings are living creatures that deserve love, deserve respect, and deserve protection from people who would do this to them. And that's being kind. And if you've taken it a step further and got to know some of these animals, well, then you can't help but fall in love with them. And by default, you can't help but become a kinder human being and a better person to be around and have a better quality of life because you become more loving. That's what kindness is. It's becoming a more loving human being. And when you become a kinder person, you find a connection to people more easily. You learn how to get out of your way. You become someone who walks with a much lighter footprint and you're always finding opportunities to find joy, to find humor and to find connection, whether it's with another human being or the elements in nature or another being, not just a human being, another being, because you recognize that these beautiful creatures feel joy, feel fear, and have a right, a God-given right to be protected and to enjoy a certain quality of life. And that's what the kindness formula is all about. It's recognizing that. Now, like I said before, we all begin this journey being kind when we're young. You remember when you were a little kid? You were born, yeah, you had your, you had your days when you weren't so nice. <laughs> we all did. But for the most part, children are kind. We are born kind. I mean, think about the kind of books your parents read to you when you were kind. Do you think they were Torah of Duty, Assassin's Creed? No, they were about like things like animals. You were connecting and you were open to connecting with love and nature and spirit and your higher self. And you loved hearing about the animals and you loved learning about their wonderful lives. And you found this bond. And remember when you were a little kid, you wanted to have a pig and you wanted to have a pet cow and a horse. I know I did. And we know instinctively as children that a deer here in this case looks at her baby, looks at this beautiful fawn, and she loves that baby. We understand that as children. Just like when we look at this beautiful picture of this, this cow and her, be, her baby, we understand that she absolutely adores her baby and would do anything for her baby. Just the same as a human being with her baby. That's what kindness allows you to do. Kindness is a perspective that allows you to see wider and deeper as far as what's real and what's not real. Okay. And when we talk about kindness, there's three kinds of people who experience kindness in various degrees. Again, we all experience kindness when we were young, but unfortunately we learn to go to sleep. So I want to talk about the three kinds of people today who are either experiencing kindness or are insulated from kindness. The first kind of person is the person who is asleep. This is someone who, again, once upon a time was kind, but has learned, has been conditioned by the media, by culture, by their parents' beliefs, and now has firmly held beliefs about others and is loyal to those beliefs and will defend those beliefs. And as a result, this provides an opening to grow prejudice and hate and fear and contempt, which is awful, and indifference. So we don't do anything when someone else is suffering because they are others. Okay. And then, of course, we have 
the anxious. The anxious know. They just know in their gut that something's wrong in the way that the world is turning and the beliefs that we are sharing collectively. They know something is wrong, but they haven't quite figured out what that something is yet. And as a result, because they don't know and they have that awful feeling, they're, they're much more likely to experience depression, anxiety. They're much more likely to experience overeating or having other kinds of addictions, whether it's watching television too much or procrastination. That's another addiction. And they often have a lack of purpose because they haven't quite figured it out yet. What is that thing that is wrong and, and how is that having an impact on them? They don't quite get it yet. And the indirect cost of violence is substantial. It is depression. Depression is a significant contributor to the global burden of disease and affects people in all communities around the world today. Today, depression is estimated to affect some 350 million people, according to uh, the World Health Organization. Okay. And they also forecast that depression will replace heart disease as the heaviest disease burden by 2020. And that's indirectly because people are just anxious about the way the world is turning and they don't know what to do about it. And there's lots of other variables as well, but kindness or lack of kindness, lack of empathy, lack of compassion wears away at people. It's not our natural state. And to make matters worse, there's over 800,000 people a year who commit suicide. And there are many more people who attempt suicide. And suicide was the second leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds globally in 2012. And that number is expected to grow. Okay. And then we have the people who are awake. These are the people who are the real leaders on the planet. These are the people who are the real hope of the planet. These people are kind. They feel a connection to something bigger than themselves. Maybe it's God, maybe it's something else, but they feel that connection. Maybe it's nature. They feel connected to others. And others includes nature, other human beings, other animals. This is what kindness is. They see themselves in others. And that is nothing new. We all know the word namaste, which means I celebrate in you the place where we meet, the place where we are one. This is nothing new. It's not commonly practiced anymore, but it's certainly not new. They see suffering in others. They, they actually see it. They don't turn their head. They don't tune it out. They don't turn the channel. They see it. They're present. And it's hard. It's hard to be awake sometimes in a world that's asleep. But this, these people are the hope of this planet. And these people realize that if the world is going to change, it's not going to come from the people who are anxious. It's not going to come from the people who are asleep. It's going to come from the people who are awake. But in order for that to happen, you can't just be kind and be awake. You have to inspire people to change and to see what you see and see the good in what you see and see the cost in not seeing what you see. That's the challenge that we're all in right now. And of course, that process includes waking people up. And that is our challenge. They also eat a kind diet. A kind diet is eating foods that never had a mother. So that would include not eating anything from dairy, any product made from dairy, any product made from an animal of any kind. Uh, or any kind of excretions. And that's kind of the difficult one for some people because they love their eggs. It's, uh, it's one of the most cholesterol-rich foods on the planet. And one thing people aren't aware of is your body does not need to take on additional cholesterol. Your body produces cholesterol on its own. It does not need any other outside sources of cholesterol. This is something we've been led to believe by the food industry who sell cholesterol-laden products. And they tell us that, well, it's good. Just make sure you keep it down to a low level. Uh, well, no, you don't need any cholesterol. In fact, it's bad for you. It, it gives you heart disease. Okay. So here's the challenge. Here's the kindness challenge. For one full week, what I'd like you to do is only eat foods that did not have a mother. 
pretty good, pretty good. There's lots of healthy foods out there. And uh, if you don't know where to find uh, recipes, just buy a vegetarian cookbook or a vegan cookbook or go to savinglivesforksandknives.com and, and uh, listen to Jenna Goodhand talk about how all the wonderful, nutritious, delicious foods you can eat that didn't have a mother. <laughs> and it's better for your heart and better for your uh, cholesterol and probably going to make you more uh, likely to avoid cancer. Okay, the next step is to record how you feel. And if you notice any changes as a result of eating this healthy, feel good, kind diet, okay, notice how you feel and record any changes. Okay, the next step is to see yourself in others, as they say in Namaste, see yourself in others. It's kind of weird when you first start doing this, but after a while, it feels really good. It doesn't mean that you're going to lose your sense of who you are and all your own preferences and tastes, but it extends who you are and who you see yourself. And, and it does it in a very good way, a very healing way, in, in such a way that you're less likely to fear others. Because how could you fear yourself if you're seeing yourself in others? It's a process. But if you record how you feel and if you're noticing any changes and you make a recording of this, you'll you'll see the evidence, you'll see the growth, and you'll see the kindness start to flourish. Not just in you, but with other people who are around you. Okay. And in private, here's another challenge for you. In private, look in a mirror at least once a day and say something kind to yourself. At least once a day, look in a mirror and say something kind to yourself. Nurturing, positive, inspirational. Okay. And record how you feel and notice if you uh, if there's any changes. So that's a challenge. Not bad, right? You can do that. And then repeat week one for three more weeks. <laughs> so what we have here, in fact, is a challenge that's going to last a month. OK, and then basically we're going to go into part two. We're going to go into part two once you've completed part one. Now, part two, basically what's going to happen in the next module, we're going to go into uh, learning more about how to be kinder to yourself. We're going to have some additional exercises. We're going to learn how to be kinder to others. And sometimes that can be a challenge. And we'll talk about how to encourage others to be kind, how to deal with fear. And again, fear is something that can often get in the way of us being kinder. And we're going to be talking about the habits to develop to promote kindness how kindness impacts your health and how kindness impacts your mind. So we're going to be talking about the physiology of kindness and we're going to be talking about the neuroscience and we're going to be talking about how simply the act of being kind impacts your neurotransmitters, how being kind impacts your what we refer to as patterns of association that allows you to ha either have more flow in life or not so much flow. OK, so we can look forward to that in the next module and I uh, hope you've enjoyed this module. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to send them to us here at info at healthy, wealthy and wise. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next module.